Let's do a quick comparison of main landing gear. We're going to compare the Airbus 320 family and the 737. This is an Airbus 319. This is the main landing gear. A single bogey system. Shock strut is an oleo pneumatic, controlled by computer and actuated hydraulically. First thing we notice is this up top. That is the lock stay actuator. And right next to it, the lock springs. When the main landing gear extends, the two lock springs push the side stay arm and the lock stay arm to make sure it's straight. The lock spring also pushes the lock stay to over center position. This is just a fancy way of saying it moves the arms around to lock everything in place. Now on retraction, it kind of does the opposite. The piston rod retracts and breaks the over center lock, allowing the gear to go back up. Up next, you got the retraction actuator. This is what actually makes the gear go up. The piston will extend along with all the sequence of events of unlocking and push the main landing gear inboard and into the wheel well. After that, the gear doors close. Let me show you how it actually looks like when it does retract and extend. Check this out. We were performing a gear swing on this one. You'll see the gear doors open, you'll see the nose wheel and the main wheel go up and as well as come down. Just as a reminder, this is all controlled by computer, a very specific one. It's called the LGCIU, Landing Gear Control and Interface Unit. There's two of them. Along with this, there's over a dozen proximity sensors all over the gear. It knows when it's up, it knows when it's down, it knows when it's in transition. And if in case one fails, there's also a backup. All in all, there's about 32 proximity sensors. The system is very complex, but very safe. And in case any of this does fail, they also have an option of a gravity drop. There's a lever in the flight deck that they can turn and it will gravity drop the wheels. The wheels, the weight of the wheels themselves will automatically break the lock of the door and the wheels will drop down. And those springs I showed you earlier will lock the gear in place. You know, all those fancy arms moving around. There it is in action. It gives you a good idea of how the mechanism works. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Up next, on the side of the strut, you'll see a normal braking servo valve. This basically sends hydraulic pressure to the brakes. Up top on that spar with the little components, which I failed to show, are the anti-skid components. It's basically like anti-lock brakes. Up next, this is a torque link dampener, which is right in between the torque links themselves, better known as the shimmy dampener. This will decrease the landing vibrations through the torque links. It'll prevent the main landing gear wheels from wobbling around. Kind of like this. Most aircraft that have two wheels on the main gear have this. Here we got the hydraulic supply lines for the brake assembly. That pin you see sticking out, that is the brake wear indicator. When that thing gets close to flush, we have to change the brake. Up top you see little Schrader valves and servicing ports. That's to bleed the brakes when needed. On this aircraft you also have another hydraulic supply line. One is for primary braking, one is for alternate braking. If you look closely, you'll also see the proximity sensors right around there. Right below, these are the brake temperature sensors. When the brakes get too hot, it will send an indication to the flight deck and pilots have the capability of turning on the old noisy brake fan itself. Now, this is an Airbus feature and it's an option. There are some carriers that do not have brake fans or I should say don't buy the brake fan feature. Brake fans basically reduce the ground time, makes for a faster turnaround. Don't ask me why Boeing did not put it on their airplanes. I have no clue to this day. Going back up to the shock strut, you'll see another servicing port. Once again, a Schrader valve right there. This is how we can service the shock strut with nitrogen and oil. Up next, main landing gear up lock assembly. This is what actually holds the main landing gear up via this knuckle. When that gear goes up, it will lock into that little unit and will stay up. Also, in a free-fall deployment of the main gear, that's where it will let go. Okay, up next, the 737. This is longer than I thought. The 737 sits much lower and the gear is a bit smaller, but the components almost mimic each other. A few variations here and there, but the concept is almost the same. Insert the Airbus versus Boeing conversation. <laughs> well, one cool thing to mention is that Goodyear, Bridgestone, Michelin all make aircraft tires. So the first things we see is a couple of junction boxes, interconnecting wiring. Right there you see proximity sensors or your wow switches, weight on wheels. Then you got your shimmy dampener or the torque link dampener right between the torque link, just like the other airplane. 
So here we go with a little bit of difference. On a 737, you only have one hydraulic supply line per brake, but it still has alternate braking. It happens via selector valve. In normal circumstances, the hydraulic system B will supply normal braking. If it's not capable of providing sufficient pressure to the brake, system A will take over. Just to note, 737s have three hydraulic systems. System A, system B, and a reserve, as well as an accumulator for braking that feeds off of system B. Up next, the brake pin wear indicator as the last aircraft. This is a retention cable. Basically links the two brakes together in case the wheel falls off. It won't allow them to separate. Notice this aircraft did not have brake temperature sensors. Looking to the top of the strut, we see the same thing as the last one, a servicing port for the strut. And looking to the other side, almost the same type of lock mechanisms. Down lock actuators, up lock actuators, and the main gear retraction actuator. That one was hidden inside the spar. But here's a good representation of what it looks like when it's up or down. But as you can see, it has the same type of components, even the lock springs, to push these arms over center and to lock them into place. Here's a better look at the up lock mechanism. This is what actually holds the gear up. When it comes up, it will lock into place via this little knuckle right here. There it is. Just as a reminder, this aircraft also is capable of doing a gravity gear drop. The cables are in a flight deck. One funny thing most people like to argue with is that they say 737 doesn't have gear doors. Yes, they do. They're right there. Inner door, center door, and outer door. They're just attached to the strut assembly. All they do is provide an aerodynamic seal when a gear goes up. The outboard tire is actually exposed to the elements, but that's why you have the cap right there to protect the rim assembly, or the wheel assembly, I should say. On the inside, you really don't need it because it's tucked up inside the wheel well. But this is your standard tire on a 737, the servicing port, an overpressure port, and all the tie bolts all around it. Since the wheel well is exposed, there's a really interesting feature this aircraft has. This little unit right here, this is called the frangible fitting. Let's say there's a damaged tire on takeoff and it's spinning and trying to go up into the wheel well. We don't want any kind of damage happening inside the wheel well. Damage of that tire will shear that little frangible fitting and the main wheels will stop retracting. They will go back down to prevent any kind of damage in the wheel well. That's about it, folks. That's as much as I can fit and that's as much as I can talk. <laughs> Whether you like Airbus systems or Boeing systems, both are reliable, both are producing a great product and both are safe so thank you once again for watching hope you guys enjoyed it and gained more knowledge take care and i'll see you on the next one